too bad for <laughs> guys who are not here. <laughs> All right. Uh, one of the questions, apologies for that. Uh, one of the questions in the break was, uh, um, you know, this partitioning of feature space versus the partitioning that we discussed when talking about decision trees. And uh, on the right hand side here, I have, uh, well, you know, invented the way a decision tree could look at the same problem. And, uh, you know, both tessellate space. So a multi-layer perceptron tessellates space and a decision tree tessellates space. The fundamental difference is that the decision tree always makes these conditional decisions. Yeah? So what I mean by conditional is that if we have already cut here, then my next cut is going to affect only one half, only one half space. And, uh, and it, it does not affect the other half space. And now this has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, an advantage is that if I plot a decision tree <clears throat> um, similarly to a, uh, you know, if I draw a similar electrical engineering kind of diagram of a decision tree, uh, then the advantage of a decision tree, or one advantage, is that um, my input uh, goes down a single path. Yeah, so my input maybe follows this path in the decision tree, and uh, all of the other computations are never performed. Whereas here, my input, it goes through the entire neural network until some output is being produced. So fundamentally, I need more floating point operations for the neural network. Um, now, in the world of uh, GPUs and uh, highly you know, multi-core CPUs, uh, that turns out to be uh, not such a big advantage for decision trees after all. Or maybe even uh, vice versa, well, there are different ways of implementing a decision tree, but one way is via, you know, conditional branchings and such, and uh, those will require more instructions than just, you know, sending it brute force through an entire network, as long as this network has a pretty regular structure. And now another difference here is that um, each perceptron contributes to the definition of many regions. So uh, here, a single perceptron corresponds to the definition of this polyhedron and that polyhedron and that polyhedron and that polyhedron. So somehow, um, out of a given number of computation units, I could say that I get more expressive power in the case of the neural network. So somehow, I can model more complicated decision surfaces using the same number of computation if I use neural networks. The downside of this higher expressive power is that it becomes more difficult to train because we will anyway talk about training, uh, actually then next week. Um, let's say that um, the there was a need to move this decision to move this thing a little bit yeah, because there was one uh, red point on the wrong side. So we would actually like to nudge uh, this perception a little bit so that the red point ends up together with the other red point. So we move our perception a little bit where we want to move it. But unfortunately, it also moves also in places where we don't want to change it because it was already fine. And may maybe making it better in one place will make it actually worse in another place. And uh, hence, neural networks are fundamentally uh, difficult to train. And uh, this is why we need easily tens of thousands of iterations to train a neural network well, which is possible nowadays, but was an unsurmountable obstacle uh, a few years ago. So this is one explanation of you know, why are neural networks so powerful nowadays and not 10 years ago, or 20 years ago. OK. Now to the function counting theorem. 
And uh, what I've written here is in the public document, so you can, um, because there are not important formula that I want you to know by heart, I want you to understand the concept, <clears throat> and this may be easier if you don't have to write it at the same time. Uh, this goes back to uh, Thomas Cover. He wrote his PhD thesis on this topic, and uh, you might know the name because he has written a book on information theory, which is also very well known. And it's an interesting thesis. Uh, you, can, you can download it from, I think, MIT. It's very thin, what, 30, 40 pages. And uh, well, the main contribution of this thesis is what we will discuss now on this uh, next page here. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, you can argue you know, it's at least not many pages of paper were needed to explain what he did. But it was a uh, you know, very elegant uh, proof that he found, um, so elegant that we can actually discuss it in, in a few minutes. And uh, what he looked at was the fraction of linearly separable dichotomies. Now, first of all, let me write this more clearly. And what I'm showing here is what I wrote, you know, in real time in a lecture uh, a few years back. So this is why the handwriting is as bad as always. So dichotomy. What is a, a dichotomy? It's a way of partitioning your uh, your data. So if I have a few points, um, like say the, th the three points here. I have a two-dimensional space. This is my feature x1. This is my feature x2. And um, there are now various ways of assigning labels. Now, in a real training set, of course, I will always have labels. Like this was the red class, uh, and those were the blue classes. But he's interested in... Uh, uh, well, abstracting this and uh, talking about if I, um, for two classes, um, there are two to the power of n possible ways of assigning labels. Yeah? So for example, uh, this could be plus, and this could be plus, and this could be plus, or I could make one of them a minus, or I could make uh, two of them a minus, and so on. Yeah? So there are two to the power of n possible uh, ways of assigning labels, or two to the power of n uh, dichotomies, and he wants to know how many of these are linearly separable. So actually, as long as I have three points in a 2D plane, all of them are separable. When I move to four points, not all are linearly separable. Yeah? So, for example, uh, if I say uh, all are positive, all are class plus, this is fine. I just put my decision boundary somewhere and say on this side is positive and the other side is negative. Um, if I make one of the classes negative, that's also still fine. I use this decision boundary. But if I now make that class negative, then you know, try as I may, there's no way of linearly separating all the points. So question is, out of all 2 to the power of n dichotomies, how many are linearly separable? And uh, moreover, um, actually, um, the question he asks is, uh, or in this proof, we will need the question is how many are homogeneously linearly separable? <coughs> so that means that the decision boundary um, has to go through the origin. And It doesn't really matter where the origin lies. So here I've put it uh, inside, but but I might just as well, I might just as well putting it, be putting it somewhere here. 
Um, so if I ask for homogeneously linearly separable, then not all partitions are possible. So for example, minus minus plus would be possible. I use this decision boundary. But if I say um, if I say plus plus minus, <coughs> this will not be possible. Yeah, so I can uh, if I use this decision boundary, then I'm misclassifying the negative point. If I'm using that decision boundary, I'm misclassifying, uh, or that's anyway wrong. If I use this decision boundary, then I'm misclassifying uh, that point here. <coughs> so that's a restriction, of course. By saying it should be homogeneously linearly separable, I lose a degree of freedom. and uh, it becomes even harder to separate all possible dichotomies. All right. So uh, what does this so-called function counting theorem state? It states that the fraction of linearly separable dichotomies, so how many of these assignments of labels uh, that this uh, divided by all possible dichotomies, uh, that this fraction goes to 1 as the points are in a high enough dimension and as long as the points are in general position. <coughs> now, what does general position mean? Uh, it means that um, we have uh, no more than... Okay, let me give an example. In two dimensions, any two points define a line. So it's unavoidable that two points lie on a line. But if a third point lies on the same line, then the points are said not to be in general position. Yeah, because in general position would be that my third point resides anywhere in space, and that would not be on the, on the same line. Yeah. Or let's, let's talk about the R3. So if I have x1, x2, and x3, I have some plane in this space. Each plane will be spanned by three points. But if a fourth point were to be on the same plane, then that fourth point or then that set of points would no longer be in general position. So another way of saying what I've just said is that um, every p element subset of points must be independent in a p-dimensional space. Now, um, Cover makes this induction argument. He says that um, let's start with n points in p dimensions and let's say that c n p of them are homogeneously linearly separable. Whatever the number is, we just you know, call it C of n and p. Now we add an extra point that's still required to be in general position without increasing the dimensionality. Yeah, so we use the same space and we just add another uh, point in there. Then, um, now we have one point more, so we have now n plus one points in p dimensions, and uh, we want to say how many homogeneously linear separable dichotomies are there. And then the, the crucial insight is that it's uh, the number that we previously had plus a new one. And uh, let's look at these two terms, yeah, the old and the new one. So the old dichotomies are those where we just used the old decision boundaries that were used to find this previous number C of n and p. And we simply adjust the label on the new observation um, to match these previously found labels. Yeah, so here in this example, um, 
I had uh, three old points and one new point. And for each of the decision boundaries that was previously used to generate the dichotomies, I simply adjust the label. Uh, for example, here it lies on the negative side of the decision boundary, so I give it the label minus. Yeah, so, I, so this uh, gives me the old number of homogeneously linearly separable dichotomies. But now, in addition, we would like to know, is it possible to also give a different label um, to this new point that we have just added? So to answer that question, um, we say that we are looking for a decision boundary that goes right <coughs> through our new point. Um, because if it goes right through the point, then we can wiggle it a little bit left or a little bit right in order to give either label to this new point. Now, if I force my decision boundary to go through the new point, I lose one dimension of my feature space because I can now project along this <coughs> vector between new observation and origin. And this is why um, there are now uh, n other points whose uh, dichotomies I want to count, the ones that I had previously, but in only p minus 1 dimensions. Um, maybe I can make another sketch to explain that uh, in R3. Let's say my new point is here. This would be the point x n plus 1. Um, I now want the decision plane in this R3 to go through this point. <coughs> so um, whatever decision plane I'm using, these decision planes should all go through the origin. So I'm drawing one decision plane, I'm drawing another decision plane. Ah. And the point is that all of these decision planes will intersect along you know, this vector to the n plus first observation. And Hence, I lose one dimension from this space. And this is why I was writing, or why Thomas Cover was writing here, Cn of p minus 1. <coughs> All right, now we have a recursion relation. And uh, then we can telescope it. And so we just insert this uh, again and again. And uh, telescoping gives um, the equations that you see here. Um, so this is uh, uh, n minus 1 choose k uh, multiplied with um, these uh, this number of dichotomies um, then we need some, uh, to finish our recursion, we need the limiting cases. So um, if I have a single point in at least one dimension, then um, there are two ways of assigning a label for this. Yeah? So I have a single point in at least one dimension, and I can always find a decision boundary which assigns either the positive or the negative label to that point. Uh, and in less than one dimension, I say the number of dichotomies are zero. And with these boundary conditions, 
what you get is the framed expression here. Yeah, that there are this many homogeneously, linearly separable dichotomies of endpoints in general position in p dimensions. Now here is uh, here I've made a plot of this quantity. So n is uh, the number of points, p is the dimension. If we work in homogeneous coordinates, or p tilde would be the dimension in uh, non-homogeneous coordinates, coordinates. And um, here are now various curves for different values of p. So for example, if we look at this uh, curve here for p equals 15, 15 dimensional space, um, the What we can see here is um, if I'm given, for example, um, 30 points. So here at this point uh, where you know, see I have a 2 on my axis, I have 30 points. Um, if I have uh, 30 points, um, I have uh, 30 to the power of, I know I have 2 to the power of 30 possible dichotomies and uh, about, or not about, ha exactly half of them will be linearly separable. But if I go to a lower dimensional space, so uh, if I have fewer points, like uh, let's say if I only have uh, not 30 points, but if I only have 10 points, uh, that's still uh, 2 to the power of 10 uh, possible dichotomies, then virtually all of them will be separable yeah? because my curve here is very close to 1. So as we increase the dimensionality of space, this curve becomes more and more like a step function. And in the limit, what this tells us is that um, as long as we have uh, less than uh, twice, so if the number of points is less than uh, twice the dimensionality, we will be always able to separate them linearly. And uh, if we have more points, uh, then we are probably not able to separate them linearly. And this curve is the reason why we are interested in mapping non-linearly to a higher dimensional space. So given, uh, if we have given some training set, this has n points. We cannot change n. Uh, this is just the number of samples that we have. But I can change the dimensionality in which the samples live. And what this result shows you is that uh, the higher dimensional the space, that I'm uh, projecting to, the greater the chance that a linear classifier will be able to fit all the points. And if we look back at uh, last hour, you see that at the end of this network here, we just have a single perceptron. So we just have a single classifier at the end. Um, and even if you look at you know, state-of-the-art networks. No? Let's say uh, in computer vision, we may have a whole image as input. And the final output, let's say, in an automotive application is, um, should the car make an emergency braking, yes or no? no? Like maybe there's a toddler running in front of the car or something. No? So we may, have, um, we may have very many inputs, uh, but we have a single output at the end. No? So. Uh, Whatever complicated things we do before, in the end, we just want to have a linear <coughs> classifier. And I now 
want to find a representation such that the single classifier is going to be able to fit my training data well. And the statement in this function counting theorem is that uh, with overwhelming uh, probability, this is going to be possible as long as we project into a sufficiently high dimensional space. Now, why is it important that we map non-linearly to higher dimensional space? Um, that is so important because if I just projected linear to higher dimensional space, then my points would not be in general position. And then the whole theorem does not hold. So it is of the essence to map non-linearly to a higher dimensional space. This is a statement, yes. Uh, do we need to pay if we map to higher dimensions? Um, yes, that we can overfit um, because you know the, the the flip side of this statement is that um, you know if you just randomly invent your labels, so you give me a training set of measurements uh, and you randomly invent labels then in sufficiently high dimension, I will always be able to fit these random labels. Yeah? So I'm always able to, to overfit whatever noise you give me. And uh, this is, of course, why, why regularization is always important. And in uh, networks, in deep networks, um, there is implicit and explicit regularization. So explicit means that um, we may have a bias that says, please make the weights in your network smaller, just that we had a rid regression or, or in the lasso. Um, and then there are less obvious ways that also turn out to be uh, regularizers. And they are really important to, to achieve good performance. Uh, another way of regularizing is structural um, by uh, especially in computer vision, we can just not afford, in terms of numbers of parameters, um, to have completely to work with plain perceptrons. Uh, we would have just you know zillions of parameters, and uh, so we need to reduce the degrees of freedom, and uh, we do that in, in computer vision and also in audio signals and so on. Uh, by making the networks convolutional, so by forcing uh, parameters to be the same and hence reducing degrees of freedom. More questions? All right. Then um, to close on a, on a happy note, um, I'll give you a playground and I stop the recording or my GPU will be completely 